let's cook some oxtail today. <laughs> Today's show is dedicated to Ben Franklin, which if you know him as well as I know him, since he's a great Renaissance man, and so am I, by the way, <laughs> he's an interesting fellow because not only was he a scientist, an inventor, a diplomat, but he was also one of the greatest gourmets you want to know. I mean, not only when you read his recipes, he made his own beer and he developed many recipes. He was the first one to make a cheesecake out of Parmesan cheese, mind you. He was the first one to eat tofu while he was in Paris because he was trying to become a vegetarian for a very short time. It didn't last long, but he tried it. So today what we're making is a dish that is actually known the world over. Our first recipe today is braised oxtail. I think oxtail goes back to the time when people thought power came from the animals you ate. We'll be topping off our braised oxtail with fried sweet potatoes, a Thomas Jefferson's favorite. And we'll visit the American Philosophical Society started by Benjamin Franklin. Axel is just not about the 18th century. Many, many, many of the fancy restaurants today throughout the country and throughout the world do deconstructed oxtail, do oxtail ravioli. The oxtail we're making today has a little twist with the West Indies. This happens to be a relatively small oxtail, but still it gives you the idea. There's a lot of fat on the oxtail again, and there goes back again the frugality of the 18th century, because they would not discard this fat as well. This fat would have been taken off. There's lots of fat there, and would have been rendered down. Look at that render down into lard and again for cooking and many other things they would use. They would just chop it down and use it. Also, a lot of the fat, of uh, uh, animal fats I guess, was used to melt down and then later actually put in meat and let it hang up in the root cellar to preserve it. It was actually like a coating. So what you want to do with the oxtail, you cut through it, pieces like so. Or, better than that, you go to your butcher. Have your butcher cut it for you, like about so. This is about the size of thing because it shrinks tremendously. So, in the store, they sell it like that in packages. But if you like bigger piece, you gotta tell your butcher, he organized me one, do bigger. But quite frankly, it's about an inch to an inch and a half is the right size. You need a really hot pan. You're just gonna put some peppercorns. I want them really coarse. Oh, the smell of that pepper, just dynamite. Salt and pepper, coarse, and then you want to get it in the pan. No fat in the pan, no lard, no nothing, obviously because I want to get the, the fat that surrounds the ox tail out of it. So now I put a speck on the fire. It won't take long at all. Benjamin Franklin was a scholar, a statesman, and a successful publisher. He was also one of our most remarkable scientists who started his own learned society. Benjamin Franklin started a scholarly society in 1743 in Philadelphia to rival the Royal Society of London. He named it the American Philosophical Society to encourage the development of scientific advancement in the colonies and to underline its importance Congress later voted to put the society in a building right next to Independence Hall. Hey, Dr. Levitt. Walter, how are, how are you? <laughs> so nice to take the time out of your busy schedule to enlighten me a little bit. Pleased to do it. <laughs> uh, we're here in the reading room of the library, and uh, here we have a number of scholars uh, working with original materials. I've brought some materials to show you, and um, why don't we go this way and I'll show them to you. Can't wait. Great. <laughs> These are the journals of Lewis and Clark. Thomas Jefferson, when he was president of the United States, sent two captains in the army. Uh, Meriwether Lewis was uh, his personal secretary. And uh, the Corps of Discovery West to really establish our new ownership of the Louisiana Purchase. Thomas Jefferson became the bargain shopper of all time when in 1803 he purchased the vast area west of the Mississippi River all the way to modern-day Montana in the Louisiana Purchase. 
as president of both the United States and the American Philosophical Society. Jefferson commissioned an expedition led by his assistant, Meriwether Lewis, and William Clark to survey the new territories. I brought out my favorite. This is Lewis. They've already reached the Pacific coast. These went across the country and back, wrapped in an oil cloth and in the bottom of a canoe. Lewis was a naturalist. Lewis is actually describing the fact that they've been subsisting on elk flesh. He says, poor and miserable as it is, that's all they could find. And then they started pulling these guys out of the river. Oh, this is the actual size of the fish. This is not a, a salmon or something. He said, boy, these, these are a real lifesaver so for us. And he thought it so important that he, uh, he actually drew a picture for Jefferson. While the oxtail is searing, I'm going to get ready to cut my root vegetables. Now, in the recipe in the book, I only limited it down to celery roots, but today, since we are celebrating the 18th century and the taste of history, I have all of the root vegetables here. I'm starting with carrot, celery yak, I have parsnip, and woodabaker. So here, let me go cut them up quick. I want to show you. For this particular dish, I just cut them in what we call a brunoise, which is like a, a rough dice. So we can just add it into when the oxtail is ready. Remember, again, 18th century, wood cellar was really what drove this whole culinary, culinary time because you didn't have any garden, you have no supermarkets, you have no airplanes, you have no grocery stores. So obviously those chefs had to be pretty creative and getting, getting product to them, which the wood cellar was it. The onion for that, I'll just cut coarse, just about so. Maybe a little bit more onion in there. Let me get this one over here. Easy. And there we go. Let me check on the oxtail quick. I heard making quite some racket behind me means the, the oven is really, the fire is really gone. All right. Oh, man. Oh, the flavor of the, the fat and the, the peppercorns, just spectacular. All right. Put it right back on it again. You want to keep this at high heat because you really want the fat to render out and the fat is what gives the great flavor. Okay. Now, while this is cooking over here, I have a platter. Let me put the brunoise right in there. I'll get ready on the peppers. One of uh, Thomas Jefferson's favorite peppers is the cayenne pepper. The cayenne pepper is potent, but not as potent as its cousin, the habanero or the scotch bonnet. So just to understand that. So what we do is put a little bit, chop the pepper down. Notice that I take the seeds out of this one because the seeds, right around the seeds, is where all the, the oils are that gives you the, that gives you the heat. Oh yeah, Whew. you can really tell the potency of that. So you chop this down, of course, or if you want to make this for company, if you want to make this at home, and you don't want to get your company to get uh, fired up too much, you can leave them whole or in half, and then you can fish them out. Actually, why I'm doing this with the habanero. What I do with the habanero is I'll take it, and I take a fork, and I pierce it many times, just like so. And this, oh, I mean, they go up to 750,000 heat units. So I pierce it like that, and I add it into the, uh, to the oxtail so later I can fish it out, but the flavor stays within it. Now it's making a rocket behind me, so let me see how far we're doing on that. One second. A couple times you will deglaze that, because you want to make sure that you get the extra flavor out. So, so you go. Oh, voila. That smells good. I don't think there's a better smell than that, and I'm sure Dr. Franklin would agree with me. Oh, beautiful. Red wine, 
pepper, oxtail, it don't get better than that. You notice no flour, just clean the oxtail, salt and pepper. That's all I've done in there. So the wine's got to reduce down a couple of times, actually, and we call this deglazing in culinary terms. It just means to put the wine in it, let it reduce down, like so, and bring it up again. You put a little bit more wine in it. And then, at this stage of the game, you put in the, what we call mirepoix, which is basically the root vegetables already cut, as I explained it. We have the one pepper that I pierced. Now, if you like flavor, if you like heat, if you can handle it, you can also chop it up. But the flavor of this will work. Now I have some thyme. that I sprinkle over there a little bit. I have some mushroom. And I have garlic. And garlic, again, for this, usually when I cook those recipes, or many recipes, you sweat down the garlic. In this recipe, you don't because. This is takes now from this stage until you can eat it. You're talking about 45 minutes to possibly an hour until the meat is very tough because it's a muscle. But that's what makes the great flavor. So then you want to hit it again with a good amount of wine. I mean, literally a good amount of wine. And now I'm going to put it on the fire. A bit of salt. A little bit more peppercorn from before because pepper and this just likes each other. Okay. Go back on the fire. Here we go. Put it right on here. All right. In a studio in this same building, Charles Wilson Peel painted the portraits of many of the significant figures of this time. At the turn of the 19th century, Peel started the first natural history museum in America by displaying preserved plants and animals, fossils, and other scientific wonders on the third floor. What we're looking at is one of two known drafts of the Declaration of Independence final copies. This particular copy was written by Thomas Jefferson for Richard Henry Lee, the representative from Virginia who stood up in the Second Continental Congress and proposed that the colonies declare their independence. Richard Henry Lee is in Virginia because his wife is ill. Mm -hmm. Jefferson, who has just finished writing the Declaration of Independence, doesn't want his fellow Virginian to miss this. So he writes out, no Xerox machines, he writes out a second copy of the Declaration as he submitted it to Congress, and he mailed it to Richard Henry Lee. Lee's of Virginia, that mm -hmm. great family, so yeah. it's Light Horse Harry Lee and Robert yeah, E. Lee. Yeah. And so, yeah. so Richard Henry Lee had a brother named Arthur, Arthur Lee. Yeah. And uh, Arthur uh, underlined every change that was made by the Congress and he wrote those changes in the margin. So right here it says, um, Jefferson says, he has neglected utterly to attend to them, and some grammarian in Congress changed it to utterly neglected instead of neglected utterly. Over the 250-year history of the society, its members have included Charles Darwin, Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, and Margaret Mead. It continues today to promote useful knowledge in the sciences and humanities. As Franklin put it, the society pursues equally all philosophical experiments that let light into the nature of things tend to increase the power of man over matter. We are gotten so used to French fries and yet very few people really credit the man that bought it here. Not that it would never eventually not come here, but... So Thomas Jefferson, in all his travels, fell in love with fried potatoes, so much so that I... You read in all his uh, documentation, he sent a chef over to learn how to do it. And really, it's not difficult, and quite frankly, a sweet potato is one of the easiest potatoes to fry, and most people again ask me, why is that? It's real simple, because a sweet potato, which is not even a potato, <laughs> it's a tuber, and it's related to the morning glory, believe it or not, but it's drier than a potato, so henceforth it has less moisture in it. Henceforth you have less of a chance to burning down your kitchen. If the pot is too small, you put the potatoes in, the oil boils over, and this is one thing you don't wanna, you don't wanna have happening. The, pot, the, the oxtail is doing good, I'm gonna move it to the side. Because I'm gonna get the oil hot. The oil has to have the proper temperature. When you do the sweet potato like that, obviously you can just trim it down like I have to. Don't 
Stone threw them away, obviously, and I'm sure they wouldn't have had that anyway. This would have been definitely reused for uh, sweet potato pie or sweet potato biscuits. And then you can cut them any way you like. Quite frankly, they already had references to shoestring potatoes, which a shoestring potato is a potato that is very fine, like so. The oil is under fire. We just got to wait the temperature to, to get up there. And the way to test it, the best way, once it gets hot, throw in one potato, and let's see until the potato, potato starts cooking. I want to get a little bit more fire underneath there. Here. As I explained, this is a very, very delicate thing I'm doing right now. I recommend that uh, if you want to practice that at home, be very careful. Because if this oil would, uh, this oil would drop into the fire, it's not easy. I always tell people that it's a, it's a dangerous little thing, so be careful. But you see, it's already swimming, so pretty soon I can be ready cooking those potatoes. Let's see here. Now, you know, Ben Franklin, an inventor, a connoisseur, a man of the world, a Renaissance kind of man, documented a lot of his episodes in Europe. When he was in Paris, he fell in love with an ale that has Alberta spruce in the fermentation. And it's very unique because it's a beer that normally gets served only around the holiday time, but he liked it so much they kept on making it. We serving it all year long, and people really, really, truly like it. It has a little flavor of the forest in your beer. Remember, when we think of beer, you can't think of the 18th century beer, you gotta think of ales. Because beer, as we know today, which is mostly lager or pilsner, was not available because you need a lot of refrigeration for that. Not until 1850, they first start making lager once they figured out a way to get the ice houses built, to get the ice from the rivers into the ice houses. But previous to that, previous to that, it was only ale. And matter of fact, I make a lot of money by betting when I ask people, what kind of wine do you think they drank in the 18th century with a meal? People say, oh, let me see, Burgundy, Boygons, who knows what? You know what the answer is? None. The drink of choice was ale. Ale ruled it, ale in Madeira. I couldn't do a taste of history without the proper libations. You can't make beer without hop. This is how the hop goes. It's the spice of the beer. It not only balances out the sweetness of the malt, it also gives it a nice flavor. Some of the hops will give it a citrusy flavor, some will give it more of a cheesy aroma or a floral. This is the processing area, and we start every beer with a recipe, and the first part of the recipe is the grains we're gonna put in and bring to the brew house. So we have that up here in the grist case, and that's the beginning of our recipe. So this is the uh, brew house area right here, and this is the first tank we're gonna go to, which is the mash tun. What you have in there is a combination of grains, and they're all at the proper temperature to start the conversion from starches to sugars. Then we bring it to the mash tun, which is going to be able to separate the uh, grains from the sweet wort, which then we're gonna bring over to the uh, brew kettle. It boils off all the volatiles. It separates the, uh, in a sense, you know, it, it starts to get some evaporation and get some of those undesirable things to just float off out into the atmosphere. Once the, the beer gets over into the fermentation tanks, we're gonna add the yeast. And the yeast converts all the sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide. We're gonna let the carbon dioxide bubble over the top. And we just diffuse it through a bucket so that, you know, we can see how fastly it's fermenting and also, make sure nothing goes back up the tube into the tank. Gotcha. These are our cold conditioning tanks and this is where we're gonna package the product from. We're gonna be able to test it. Um, we're also gonna be able to make sure the carbonation levels are right and we can get it colder in these tanks. Okay. So we like to bottle the product cold and- Who does all the cold. testing? Uh, I do a lot of it. Do you have any openings? <laughs> <laughs> I come by with your tester. You can always come by and test. Oh, you're back. You caught me drinking here. Well, it's a delicious, a delicious ale. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's go and finish my dish here. I'm going to do some shoestring potatoes, as we already discussed. And I told you how dangerous they are when you make this at home. I don't want to be belittle that because it is oil and it is hot. And this, but it is beautiful eating. Look at the difference between a regular potato and a sweet potato you can see the dryness. So this one here is much less dangerous as would be a regular potato. 
Now we're going to see if our oil is hot, which it should be by now. Yep. And now comes the important part, so you're going to watch that. And this particular one, I'm going to have to go in the fireplace to do that because Looking good. Very beautiful. I love the color of fried sweet potato. There's nothing like it, I'm telling you. It's beautiful, look at that. Ah, oh, just gorgeous. And the, the flavor of it, because you get the, the sweetness, just spectacular. Here we go. I'm ready to plate up, and I'm sure if we had Ben Franklin here, he would approve of our dish. So the oxtail, as I mentioned earlier, stewed away for about an hour. Slowly fire. It's really spectacular. So all we got to do, you plate it. Remember, again, 18th century was all family style, so it's not like you would want oxtail on a plate. It would be a platter. It would be in the center of the table. That's why I couldn't tell you when people always ask, what do the big dignitaries of the 18th century ate? I couldn't tell you. I can tell you what's on their table, but I cannot tell you what they ate. Here we go. That is absolutely superb. We have all the root vegetables, as I mentioned earlier, incorporated inside. Now remember, that this dish does not require any fresh vegetables or summer vegetables because it's a dish just be done like that. So when you see me cooking the potatoes, I blanch them. So now I let it sit up for a little bit. You see me taking the, the grease off a little bit. I put them back quick for a crispness. Potatoes, always you do it two ways. When you buy them today, if you see them, they're pre-blanched already. Those ones here are gonna go back in here one more time. And just get crispy. You could try to do it at one step. I don't recommend it. I've always said do it two steps on it. Now comes the crisping. So you have one step, which is the blanching, and the other step is the crisping. Coming right now. There we go. Look at that, how nice they come. And in a fashion that most likely would have not served in the 18th century, but I've taken some liberties. After all, I'm a Renaissance man too. <laughs> it goes right on top. It's hot. Look at that. This dish is so fantastic. I wish I was Ben Franklin having savored this dish. Very simple, very delicious, but let me tell you something, there's nothing, nothing simple or easy about the dish. The dish itself is just beautiful. It has a great, it has a lot of character. It's a gorgeous dish and it's actually beautiful eating. Forget all the meat of the oxtail, there's this great 18th century cooking that could have been served, be it at Valley Forge, be it downtown Philadelphia, be it in Mount Vernon, be it in Monticello, everywhere. And it's served like this today, this very time, all over the West Indies and in different variations all over Asia. So oxtail is a gorgeous dish, not to be underestimated. Try it at home, it's not difficult to make. I hope you join us next season for a taste of history. <laughs>